it's great talking to people who want to be here instead of 270 first year microeconomics students who wish they were far away. <laughs> so yeah, today what I'll try to do is avoid, and I talk about modelling, and modelling of course uses equations, but I'll try to use descriptive explanation and diagrams where I can. I want to highlight the origins of stock flow consistent modelling because it is slightly different from those of MMT. And I want to introduce how models are constructed, their fundamental principles, how you account for stocks and flows, what's called the quadruple entry principle, and how you sign accounts, and the way people model asset markets. And then I look at aspects of MMT that can be carried over to an SFC framework, stock flow consistent framework, I'll look at sources and uses of funds and capital gains and losses because they can be quite important in certain kinds of modelling. Uh, I'll look at the crucial accounting identity that basically links the um, provision of net financial assets to deficit spending. And I'll look at open economy models and sectoral balances. Uh, touch on something that's called the Sraffa super multiplier, which is um, a topic of um, quite some interest at the moment. Look at Bill's sort of take on the last budget and how you can apply sectoral balances in the Australian context. And I'll look at a, another case study which is work at the Bank of England using a stock flow consistent approach to financial instability. And then I'll look at some resources that are available for stock flow consistent modelling. Okay, so this is a sort of diagram of um, some of the key concepts and differential influence on MMT and stock flow consistent models. For both schools of post-Keynesian economics, Marx, Keynes and Mikhail Kolecki were central. For MMT though, uh, they were much more influenced by Adel Lerner's idea of functional finance and he was one of the first people to promote not the job guarantee but what in those days were called employer of last resort policies. And there are a number of American economists at the time who were promoting this idea. Um, and you could say that that also influenced uh, SFC modelling, but also the general theory. And around Keynes in the 1930s, you had the Cambridge Circus, so I'll talk a bit about that. Another aspect, so from functional finance, we got MMT's emphasis on policy, the focus on full employment, with low inflation and stuff that we don't need to be obsessed about the balance of payments and the current account deficit. Uh, the issue of financial instability um, comes from Hyman Minsky, who was an influence over both strands of uh, thinking. And of course, with MMT, you have endogenous money and the emphasis on institutional practice. And the influence there are the chartalists, Kanak, Innes, and Bingham. And for stock flow consistent models, probably more the work of Nicky Caldor in the, U in the UK, who wrote a brilliant essay, The Scourge of Monetarism, uh, attacking Milton Friedman's uh, monetarist uh, prognostications. And another big influence is James Tobin. He was an American Keynesian. He helped to develop, I don't know, some of you may have heard of the capital asset pricing model, which is one of the most dominant sort of models of uh, how investors made choices about how much to invest in different shares. And he helped to develop that, but also develop this sort of portfolio approach that is very much part of stock flow consistent models. And so I'll talk about that as well. So stock flow consistent models are post-Keynesian. Both MMT and SFC modeling build on the work of not just John Maynard Keynes, but also those around him. So John Robinson, who wrote the first convincing work on imperfect competition, uh, who launched the capital debates, really, which I'll come back to. Piero Straffa, an Italian Marxist economist. Richard Kahn, Nicky Caldor, who became a Labour Lord, so you have to refer to him as Lord Caldor now. Mikhail Kolecki, the Polish economist. And as I mentioned, uh, James Tobin wasn't part of the Cambridge Circus. He was an American Keynesian. Um, another precursor was the work of what was called the Cambridge Economic Growth Project, which really came to the fore in the 1980s. Uh, Godley, uh, Richard Stone, Featherstone, and Cripps 
And um, some recent developments include the Bank of England work that I'll go into. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz has done some SFC modeling too with some UK post Keynesians, so Steve Kinsella, among others. Okay, so SFC models all adopt a three step approach to model development. They first write out what are called balance sheet and transactions matrices. You then go through a process of counting variables and extracting accounting identities from these matrices. And I'll show you what that means. And then you have to introduce further behavioral equations that characterize unknowns, or you can characterize them using an accounting identity from step two. So either a behavioral equation or an accounting identity. Now a very simple model can just work with elementary accounting identities and a simple uh, model of consumption. But behavioral models can become more sophisticated than that. Okay, so I'm not going to give you a lecture on accounting, but at least at a basic level, each item in the balance sheet of either a firm, a household, or government records the outstanding amount of an asset or a liability. The outstanding amount on the balance sheet is a stock, so it's a measure of an asset at a point in time. But what has to be integrated with that is the recognition of flows, okay? Flows to finance productive activity. Uh, if you go back to Marx, of course, he talks about the monetary circuit. Merchant capital, commodities are used and sold for money, which is then used to buy more commodities. <coughs> In a production circuit, money is used to purchase the means of production, commodities like labor power and capital, which are then combined to produce goods, which are then sold for money. And that process of production, you begin with money and end with money, but the money you end up with, if capital is successful, will be a larger amount than what you started with. And of course that is realized, it's the realization of surplus labor that's built into production. Okay, so you have flows of money, you also have flows of investment, flows of consumption, and you want to integrate stocks and flows together. Now it's crucial to recognize that both SFC modelers and MMT accept Piero Straffa's critique of mainstream capital theory and of the marginal productivity theory of income distribution. Now why is this important? It's important because if you fall back on mainstream economics, mainstream capital theory, you get really conservative outcomes. Okay, so anyone who's interested, there's a good wiki site with a few links to it that you can have a look at. And um, that, of course, also makes behavioral equations uh, simpler. They tend to have their source in these sort of growth models that Nikki Kaldor and Mikhail Kolecki were developing at Cambridge in the 1940s, 50s. And in contrast, if you look at mainstream models, the marginal productivity of capital is key to their conservative results. It rules the roost. It's what determines an optimal growth path that's going to be close to full employment in the economy. So we need the capital debates to undermine mainstream models which give you these conservative results. Okay, so how do you account for stocks and flows? Well, the simple rule is that everything comes from somewhere and goes somewhere. There are no black holes. Someone's spending has to be someone else's income, okay? And that comes from James Tobin. He was one of the people who promoted that idea. And the Abel Learner as well, you'll find some aspects of it. Debt for someone must be a credit for someone else in the economy. And flows accumulate as stocks. So positive saving, for example, implies an increase in wealth, in net wealth, which is a stock item. But also stocks can flow back on flows. An example of that is when you've got higher levels of debt, a stock, that's going to imply higher future interest payments, which is a flow. So you want to link all those flows and stocks together. And also when you're looking at long-term modeling, um, you can impose 
behavioral norms, stock flow norms, which you presume the economy has to achieve, uh, and that <coughs> simplifies some of the modeling work. Now, we're going to look at a transaction flow matrix, and in that matrix, all your rows and columns sum to zero. And in long run modeling, you want to have a, a flow matrix along with a, what's called a revaluation matrix that accounts for capital gains and losses. <coughs> okay, and that has to be linked back to the stock matrix to find the evolution of stocks. Now, what is this quadruple entry principle? Well, here I've got a, a quote from Copeland from 1949, and the next quote here is from Hyman Minsky, uh, much later in 1993, and you can find this paper on an archive, and basically they're saying the same thing. But have a look. Okay, so you get this idea, every entry is going to appear in four different places, quadruple accounting. And um, of course, another thing that uh, is emphasized in both cases, both SFC and MMT, the payments mechanism is crucially important, and we need to understand its nature. Uh, well, that's straight out of the United Nations national accounts, and again, it basically reproduces that idea of the quadruple accounting system. Now, what about signing accounts? Well, when you're looking at current transactions, a positive sign is a receipt, a negative sign denotes a payment. When you're looking at flow of funds accounts, you're talking about the sources of funds and how those funds are used. So a positive sign denotes a source of funds, so you can think of it as a tag <coughs> in the wall with the funds coming out. A negative is a use of funds, so you can think of a sink. Uh, water flowing down a plug hole, okay? And flows that accumulate um, determine the end of period stocks. In a balance sheet, however, a positive sign before a variable denotes an asset, whereas a negative sign denotes a liability. Now, when we talk about portfolio models, um, in the general theory, chapter 17, Keynes talked about short-run equilibrium in asset markets. And he talked about the elements or components of that. Each asset would have an own rate of return. It could have a carrying cost that was zero, or it could have a carrying cost that was positive. The carrying cost for things like antiques or you know, Persian carpets could be quite high. You've got to look after them and maintain them and keep the insects and bugs away. Wine has quite a high carrying cost. Um, the carrying cost for money on their money is very low. Assets also have a liquidity premium. The liquidity premium is very high on money, or near money, but on assets like uh, long-term investments in plant and equipment, buildings and structures, they're highly illiquid assets. We know they're problematic. If you want to divest yourself of a steel mill, you've got to find someone who wants to buy a steel mill and who's going to pay you fair value. And that might be very, very <coughs> difficult. So we're talking about the whole spectrum of assets, both financial and real, here in Keynes' chapter 17. Another component is the expected capital gain, and we also have the nominal interest rate. In Keynes' world, everything is nominal, not real. Okay, because when we enter into contracts, very few of those contracts are specified in real terms. They're almost always specified in nominal terms, and that includes wage contracts as well. Does anyone know of any assets whose value is specified in real terms? They do exist. You can get indexed bonds that guarantee returns in real terms, but most of the time, it's nominal. Now, how do we interpret this equation? What's the transmission mechanism? Well, Keynes, of course, put a lot of emphasis on uncertainty. 
When uncertainty increases, you lack the confidence in the calculations of risk that you're making. And Keynes also said in a crisis, we revert from sublime, sophisticated forms of what he called money love to regressive forms of money live, love. And I always think of Scrooge McDuck diving in and out of his money vaults. You know, he's got a diving board and he jumps in with this bed of coins and swims around. And when Donald Duck tries to do the same thing, he just crashes into the coins. But that miserliness is the regressive form of money love. Now, that can be thought of as an increase in liquidity preference. People in the face of crisis want to hold money on their money because they're fearful of a loss of capital value on illiquid assets, okay? So what that means is that the spot prices of those illiquid assets begin to fall and people have to be compensated to be willing to hold those assets given their own rates of return net of carry cost. So what that means is the spot price has to fall so that there can be an expected capital gain that compensates for the increased liquidity print. So that's the mechanism in Keynes's model of asset market equilibrium. Now when we move to James Taylor, we've got asset demand, you know, in its simplest terms, money, bonds, equities. And asset demand is a function of wealth and income. The own rates of return on money, which is zero, on bonds, which is the interest rate, or on equity, which is the return on equity. And we also have cross rates of return. So demand for a equity is not just a function of the return on equity, but also the return on competing assets, bonds and money. Okay, there's no liquidity preference in Tobin's model. What you have instead is volatility of return and anxiety about volatility. Risk. Hmm? Risk. risk. We have risk, we don't have uncertainty. Yeah. And of course, what you get is the standard mean variance approach. You minimize the variance on your portfolio for a given expected return, that's all right, on the portfolio. And that accommodates money, bonds, and equity. But we also have non-financial investment. And in Tobin's model, that's determined by something called the Q ratio. Now, you can think about the Q ratio in two ways. One way is that it's the market value of capital over its replacement cost. Now, just think about that for a moment. The replacement cost is how much it will cost you to go out and buy all those assets and pull them together. The market value is how much the market values the shares in your company, or how much they value that company as a going concern. If the market value is much higher than the replacement cost, that's going to attract more investment. So investment will go up. The Q ratio is going to be much greater than one. Investment is going to be positive. Alternately, if the market values are low, below the replacement cost, whoa, investment is going to be zero instead. Now you can also think about Q ratio as the ratio of the internal rate of return on an individual project <coughs> divided by the user cost of funds. If the internal rate of return is higher than the user cost of funds, investment's going to be positive and dynamic. If it's less than the user cost of funds, forget it. So you can show that these are compatible, these two ways of thinking. So Tobin's approach unifies both financial investment and non-financial investment. And the Q ratio is basically, in some models, it's the required return on equity relative to the internal rate of return on the project. So you can sort of pull together um, a model where you've got the required return on equity on the vertical axis, say, and the interest rate on bonds on the horizontal axis. Now, if you're a, an MMT theorist or a post-Keynesian who believes that the money supply is endogenous, what does that mean? Well, you probably recall the idea that um, in mainstream thinking about how credit markets work, deposits make loans. So the idea is households make deposits, banks are brilliant intermediaries, the alchemists who turn short-term small deposits made by households into 
long-term large amounts lent to firms. So they can alchemically transmute a large number of small deposits made for short periods of time into large amounts lent over long periods of time to firms who need to build steel mills and oil plants and that sort of thing. So, the interest rate on bonds on the vertical axis and what we have here is an upward sloping bond curve that represents equilibrium in the bond market, a slightly flatter KK curve that represents equilibrium in equity markets, and a vertical MM curve that represents the fact that governments are targeting interest rate and the money supply is endogenous. And you can sort of manipulate these curves and calculate what might happen. The transmission, uh, what's called the transmission mechanism in all this is that equity markets are supposed to be a major source of external funds to firms. Once they've exhausted their retained earnings, they have to go to equity. And a higher required return on equity reduces the Q ratio. That implies lower investment, and that leads to lower effective demand. Okay? So that's how you can incorporate a sort of Tobin framework into your modeling. Now, in a closed economy, the transaction matrix reconciles the expenditure definition of GDP with income. And another way of thinking about it is it equates savings with investment, where savings is the amount of savings by households plus government uh, spending in excess of tax, where investment is the price times the amount of capital. And you've got your identity between um, uh, spending on the left-hand side there and income, which is split between consumption and saving and tax on the right-hand side. Now, we know that one of the things MMT highlights is the difference between vertical and horizontal transactions. So vertical transactions are between government and all the non-government sectors, banks, households, firms. Horizontal transactions are within the bank, household and firm sectors. Now, why is that, that distinction so important? Well, we'll come to that in a moment. The other thing the transactions matrix does is it establishes a relationship between the budget deficit on one hand and the private sector surplus on the other, or the government surplus and the private sector deficit in a closed economy. Okay, this is the vertical and horizontal distinction. So, governments can um, purchase goods and services from the non-government sector and also gold. Um, you can get central bank operations where the central bank buys and sells bonds. Government spending injects funds into the non-government sector and foreign exchange and gold transactions. The horizontal transactions are within banks, households and firms in the non-government sector. Now, it's not a question of deposits creating loans, which is the mainstream story. What's wrong with that story? Well, the way banks actually operate, of course, is when they find good, credit-worthy borrowers, they lend money to them. If they then find they're not meeting the requirements for reserves or for core capital under the BIS system, what do they do? Well, there are three ways they can get access to core capital. They can borrow it from other banks at the LIBOR rate. They can sell securities to uh, the central bank in return for reserves. Um, what's the third way? I just can't think for the moment. Sorry? Yes, so there you are. Three ways of getting your reserves to meet those reserves. So, what was the third jump, sorry? What was it? Deposits. There you go. <laughs> now, loans create deposits. What does that mean? It means that banks will lend to creditworthy borrowers. What happens is that as people spend down their lines of credit, those monies flow 
back into the banking system and their accumulators' deposits. So it's not a question of deposits generating loans, the reality is loans create deposits. And that's reflected by the fact that transactions sum to zero uh, in the right section of the transactions matrix, which we'll come to in a moment. Now, of course, the crucial thing as well is that taxes drain net financial assets, and what happens to them? You can think of them going into a rubbish bin or getting burnt, they disappear. So it's not as though taxes will create something like a futures fund, which you can sort of accumulate. When you have a futures fund, what does that mean? It means the government is spending to buy shares in businesses and accumulate shares in the corporate sector. But taxes drain financial assets. So, again, from an MMT perspective, if the government is running a deficit, what does it mean? It means it's spending more than it's pulling liquidity out of the economy through tax, and that means it's injecting net liquidity into the economy. Now, what will be the effect of that on interest rates? The net liquidity will build up. That will lead to an increase in demand for bonds. Bond prices will rise, so the interest rate on bonds will fall. And it will keep on falling to zero. And if the government wants to target a positive interest rate, what does it do? It has to absorb that injection of net injection of liquidity by selling bonds to the public and to the commercial banks and absorb that liquidity through bond sales to achieve a target, a positive target rate of interest. Okay, so that's the story, but it's told in this context in terms of vertical and horizontal. Okay. Can I just ask a question? Hmm. I'm puzzled about how state and local government fit in. Why are they consolidated with the sovereign debt limits? Ah, okay. Well, that's really uh, an aspect of, I mean, state governments are financially constrained. Federal governments are not. So state governments have to count their P's. I mean, when I worked for the state government, there was always this dead panic around the time when all the ratings agencies were going to be assessing the government's financial position. Oh my God, are we going to lose our AAA credit rating? If we get you know, pushed down to a AA instead of a AAA, will that mean our interest rates will go up? How much more will we have to spend you know, in interest payments on our debt if we lose our credit rating? And state governments are obsessed about that. But federal governments, because they issue the fiat currency don't have a constraint on their spending. So the distinction between federal and state and uh, local government is crucially important. But in the national income framework, they consolidate all the accounts because you're looking at the net position that's important. But the federal government, of course, is not constrained. Now, if you look at China, for example, the national government has quite low debt levels, but a lot of the provincial governments have very high debt levels. And the central government is very, very nervous about provincial government debt. And the other thing, of course, they're nervous about is asset price inflation in housing and equity markets in those provinces in China. So it tries to monitor and control. But of course, there's this other thing called the shadow banking system. <laughs> and in China, the shadow banking system is very hard to control. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons, if you look at all the Hong Kong fracas, one of the reasons why they wanted an extradition treaty to bring people back to China is because Hong Kong is probably one of the biggest uh, avenues for um, leakage of income and, well, stocks of assets out of China. <coughs> and capital flight can be a huge problem uh, the Chinese government is trying to control. And they're trying to negotiate with a lot of um, other nations friendly arrangements so they can actually try and, you know, control asset leakage. Okay, so the crucial thing is that only vertical transactions give rise to net financial assets or increases in real wealth, whereas horizontal transactions net out to zero. Now, you can see that quite clearly when you look at a simple transactions table in the closed economy model. So here we've got a transactions matrix. This is from Dos Santos and Zeza, <coughs> who are Model is at the Levy Institute, and that's one of the resources I've given you links to. Okay, so what have we got? We've got households, firms, government, banks. We have consumption, government spending, investment, wages, taxes, taxes on wages in households, 
and taxes on firms. We have the interest on loans that go to firms and are issued by banks. Interest on bank bills issued by uh, banks to, sorry, by government to banks. Interest on deposits uh, provided by households to the banking system. And we have dividends paid by the banks and by firms to households, which appear in this column. Okay, sorry, here. And down the bottom here, we have our identity that sort of sums things up, and we look at savings by households, retained earnings by the firm sector, capital investment, savings by government, and we'll just assume that banks zero out because they're distributing their uh, dividends to households. And all the column sums here sum to zero, and this whole row sums to zero as well, but that is a fundamental accounting identity. So, sources and uses, what are they? Well, they can be determined by reading the entries in each of the cells in any given column. In the household sector, sources of funds are wages, interest on deposits, distributed dividends from banks. The uses of funds are consumption and payment of taxes. For the firm sector, sources of revenue from the sale of goods and services. And when you sell capital, you get a capital gain. That's a source of revenue too. So that's why you need a revaluation account to account for capital gains and capital losses. And the funds are used for investment or payment of corporate tax, payment of interest on borrowing, and for distribution of dividends, okay? So these are the sources and uses of funds. Banks receive interest on loans and issue bank bills okay. and use their funds for payment of interest on deposits and the distribution of profits. Okay. When you sum across all the rows of those transactions accounts, it's apparent that all the transactions are going to cancel out with the exception of the interest paid on bank bills by government, the payment of taxes by firms and households, and the receipt of revenue by firms for the sale of goods and services to the government. They're the vertical transactions, okay? The bottom row indicates government savings or tax revenue, net of government spending and payment of interest on bonds are equal to the non-government sector's dis saving. Now that's a crucial accounting identity. It implies in periods when the government's running continual budget surpluses, although you could sustain economic growth over the short run, that's only going to happen <coughs> if the non-government sector is running an ongoing deficit and accumulating ever-increasing levels of debt. And that is Minsky's notion of financial instability. So these accounting frameworks link to this problem. When you're running surpluses, you're driving the non-government sector into deficit, and you're going to accumulate huge problems that will lead to financial instability. OK. What's this Straffer super multiplier? Well, a bunch of Italian economists, they see Straffer as their own, and they see him as launching a new Italian school of economic thought which is called Neo-Ricardian, but instead I tend to see Straffer as a good old Marxist economist, uh, very much part of the Cambridge tradition. He hangs out with Murray Staub, uh, who's a Marxist historian. He um, keeps Gramsci supplied with books as he's rotting in Mussolini's prison in Rome, gives him an open credit line, and uh, you know, he's a good old comrade. So, anyway, the Straffer supermultiplier is motivated by the fact that a lot of spending seems to now be cut off from disposable income. Instead, it's driven by wealth effects and asset price inflation in housing and equity markets. Now that can be good when it's a virtuous cycle, but it can be bad when it works in reverse. So, it's also something aggravated by growing inequality of income and wealth. I mean, Kalecki's sort of simple maxim is that workers save to spend, but capitalists spend to save. And that's an important nostrum. The normal Keynesian multiplier translates impulses into increases in effective demand, but the sensitivity of investment to changes in demand boosts overall effective demand even more, and that's what we call the super multiplier. But in Australia at the moment, we're just coming out of a housing downturn, and over that whole period, 
the super multiplier has been working in reverse because house prices being depressed leads to reduced spending that's induced by wealth rather than disposable income and we're getting the negative consequences rather than the positive. This is a, a graph of um, household income in America by quintile and you've got the top 5% there as well. And it looks at uh, 2017 mean income and we've got the graph showing of course that all the growth, if you look at the four quintiles here, they're all flatlining and the growth is in this and that. So, top 5%, the top quintile. And that's of course why super multipliers are becoming more important as well, because of this growing inequality. What would the top quintile be if you minus pairs left the top 5%? Will it be more flatter? Well, I think the top quintile is inclusive of the top 5%, yeah. 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 So if you take the top 5% out of it, it would be closer to, but you can see this one's a little bit, it's moved up a little bit compared to the brown one. So there is some increase, albeit small, and you find excluding the top 5%, it would probably be just a little bit higher. All right, but yeah, it's all pretty grim really, isn't it? And we call, I mean, in MMT circles, we talk about real wage repression, which basically <laughs> means wages are not keeping up with productivity growth. And all through the Keynesian full employment period, for 25 years, not only was it said that the local minister for employment used to know each one of the unemployed by name, because there are only ever about 2,000 of them, but, um, you know, we, we just didn't have this sort of inequality growing, and everyone was engaging in productivity sharing. So if there was productivity growth, it was seen appropriate that the workers would gain some dividend from that productivity growth. So productivity bargaining was the name of the game over that whole period. Of course, when wages don't keep up with productivity, what does it mean? It means the wage share of national income has to be continually declining relative to the profit share. So how, can, how come capital now is so in such a strong position? And why are the workers in such? I mean, we saw during the Howard Costello years, they were using trade practices legislation, they were smashing unions. But I think the underlying reality is that capital can now flow, gallivanting about the whole globe, looking for cheap, docile labor. And that's probably helped to undermine. But the other factor that's helped to undermine the, the strength of the working class is obviously unemployment. So the demise <coughs> of full employment. Um, okay, these are the sectoral balances. So you're probably mostly, I'm sure other people have talked about these, so this will be very quick. You've got three accounting identities. This is the important one because it shows the government deficits and current account surpluses generate net financial assets for the private domestic sector. And okay, this is all based on accounting principles rather than being a behavioral framework. Uh, interestingly, one of the first people to start talking about sectoral balances was Win Godley, and he had a couple of papers. There's a famous Levy Institute paper, Seven Unsustainable uh, uh, Principles, is it called? I'll, oh, I've got a, a reference to it in the resources. Yeah, where he predicted the dot-com slump, the collapse in the dot-com companies in America in 2000, 2001, and he also was one of the people who predicted the global financial crisis on the basis of his analysis of sectoral accounts uh, and stock flow relationships. Okay, this is when you've got an open economy. Now, uh, the bottom row shows that um, public sector net borrowing equals the private net acquisition of financial assets, which is private savings less investment, minus the balance of payment surplus. So this is the crucial sort of identity in an open economy where you've got your foreign sector as well as government, productive sector or firm sector, income expenditure. And this is from um, one of the uh, essay, yeah, papers by Wim Godley and Isaac Urieta, uh, who are based in the Levy Institute, Bard College, New York. Okay, so the principles carry over into an open economy. Now, this is a graph from Bill 
Bill's treatment of uh, the budget in uh, Australia. And we've got external balance. Gosh, can we saw that's the, the green edge here. The fiscal balance in blue and the private domestic balance in red. And of course, if you sort of keep the external balance in the backdrop and say, well, look, a lot of it is um, seasonal effects and then long-term trends, the fiscal balance and domestic private balance tend to be sort of a bit like mirror images of one another. And the crucial thing is you're getting at this notion that uh, the private domestic balance is going to worsen if you're moving towards surplus or above, as has happened here in the graph. And um, Bill's take, of course, on the budget, employment growth, regularly around zero. <coughs> Oh, we've seen just recently, of course, we're seeing growth in employment. What kind of employment? Part-time, Part -time. casual, precarious employment. Yep, the unemployment rate has edged up marginally, and of course, <coughs> uh, what's her name jumping up and down? The Minister for Employment saying, oh, that's all the participation rates in increase, and that's why we're not getting uh, the dividend from our marvellous employment record. Australian households, of course, carrying record levels of debt, Real estate prices at the time of the budget were plunging. They're slowly turning around now. And we've seen the participation rate increasing. The um, tax dividends are going to give massive benefits to high income cohorts, very little relief to low income earners. The external sector, of course, in deficit, in deficit. Three oh, we had a bit of a blip because of iron ore. Why? Because uh, Brazil had a tailings dam collapse and you know, had a big impact on iron ore prices temporarily. Reserve Bank have written that up in their August monetary policy statement, if anyone wants to read about it. Uh, but okay, that's a temporary phenomenon. So private sector, um, the government rather, is intending to run um, a fiscal surplus or deficit below 3.5% of GDP, and private domestic sector has to um, be spending more than it receives overall. So that the big problem is you're forcing the non-government sector into that unsustainable deficit. Uh, boom, boom. And of course now they're almost achieving a surplus on the back of underpayment of the disability support payments. Um, but as they move into a stronger sort of surplus position, they're really putting more strain on the whole system. Okay, and the budget was based on some really dodgy projections, uh, an unbelievable projected rise in wage growth. I mean, the Reserve Bank government's been saying, we, not, we ought to have increases in wages. We ought to be increasing new stuff. And he's just talking to deaf ears. And the blog appeared after the budget, but predictions have largely been confirmed. Now, one of my great Frustrations. I mean, I've had PhD students who are doing SFC modeling, but they're doing it for Bangladesh, they're doing it for Pakistan, they're doing it for the GFC in America. No one's actually estimated an Australian SFC model yet. Uh, so I'm still waiting for that to happen. You might ask, well, why haven't, you know, haven't I done it yet with one of my PhDs? It's a good question. <laughs> I think, you know, people want to estimate, it's easy to get US data and estimate the GFC because you've got a lot of models that have been built to, um, to do that. So it's a sort of convenience as much as anything. Now, in the UK, on the other hand, Bowen and Burroughs, 2011, looked at what was going on, trying to find linkages between a lot of the macro puzzles and highlighting balance sheet linkages to spot financial fragility. So that was the purpose of this piece of work. And, uh, Households borrowed far more than was required to fund their net lending position at the time. You had residential mortgage-backed securities coming into play in 2001 through to 2007, and they were playing a big role in closing what is called the funding, the customer funding gap. Young household net financial wealth fell as they took on more debt. Older household net financial wealth rose as they sold housing to the younger generations to buy financial assets and housing wealth rose for most middle-aged households. Highly leveraged buy-to-let sort of investors were the source of a, a bit of a bubble 
in Minsky's sense of the word. Uh, it's the idea of the financial instability hypothesis. You become reliant on income to repay borrowing. You borrow as much as can still be serviced with income, and then you become reliant on anticipated capital gains. Now that is exactly what Trump did over the 1980s with all his casino building and that sort of thing. He got too big to fail. He ended up in a Ponzi situation where he had to borrow to pay accumulated interest, uh, interest on his accumulated debts. And, uh, you know, Deutsche Bank decided to bail him out rather than <laughs> force him into bankruptcy because he was too big to fail. And they're still, they were the ones who supposedly leveraged all the, the Russian, you know, money that was coming in. Anyway. Okay, highly leveraged by the left, yeah. So what uh, Barwon and Burroughs did is they looked at a series of case studies, and here are a, a series of them, including equity finance, cross-border takeovers, what's going on in the housing market and the commercial real estate bubble, corporate balance sheet restructuring through private equity funding, credit card debt securitization. Now, this is great because it shows how an SFC model can actually provide very useful information uh, it's just a pity they didn't use it before the global financial crisis, <laughs> rather than to do a, a you know, retrospective, where, what went wrong uh, after the crisis. Now, SFC resources. You've got the Sotflow Consistent Modeling website, uh, where you can actually download models in Excel and in um, uh, eViews. You've got the Levy Economics Institute. Uh, they've got a series of themes one of which is stock flow consistent modeling. Uh, Godley's famous paper can be downloaded from the Levy Institute, Seven Unsustainable Processes was the name of the paper. Um, the textbook, Win Godley and Mark Lavoie, is now second edition, Monetary Economics, Integrated Approach to Money, Income, Production <coughs> and Wealth. It's a power grade Mac Macmillan. Um, there's a very helpful, uh, so I didn't get into any sort of equations and that sort of thing, but if people want to look at the, the actual model. Maria Nicolaidi has got quite a good presentation on stock flow consistent modeling, which is more, much more technical when she gets into this whole issue of capital gains and the role of equity markets. So you can look there. That's the Barwell and Burroughs paper. And uh, Bill and I wrote this uh, paper, There's No Financial Crisis So Deep That Can't Be Dealt With By Public Spending, back in 2008. And that's where I got these sort of tables linking MMT to stock flow consistent modeling. So I don't see them as counter to one another or as alternative paradigms. Um, the model in the textbook is a textbook model. So if you want to be serious about developing a more complex model, you have to go down a path, something like this. Um, at the moment, you know, Bill said to one of my PhDs, well, you should be simulating a job guarantee. And that's quite tricky. Because one of the things we keep on saying is, if you run a job guarantee, it's obviously much better than traditional Keynesian policy. Why? Well, traditional start. Keynesian, yeah? What are we going to say? <laughs> oh, you just target the spending. Yeah, you can target the spending. If you use public investment, that's good. And training, that's good. But you reach a point where you're creating jobs that won't necessarily be where the unemployed are. Unemployment is very unevenly dispersed and a lot of it's in remote areas and it's very persistent. So you need a job guarantee to absorb that, to create jobs for those people. Uh, otherwise, you'll start running into inflationary bottlenecks before you've achieved full employment. And that's, but to model that is quite tricky because how do you come to work out what proportion of job creation will be through public investment and training, what proportion will be through a job guarantee? I haven't quite worked out how to you know, with a job guarantee, you, you don't need to worry about that because you just create the jobs. You keystroke the money into existence that you require. But to model it is a bit tricky. And the other effect, of course, is when you've got a job guarantee, you're paying people at the minimum wage and they're working the hours they work, you won't have any precarious underemployment. And that boosts productivity. And it forces firms to train people if they're running into skills shortages. What is the productivity dividend on that? How do you factor that into a model? Very, very hard. So there are lots of uh, difficult things to estimate or measure, 
when you're trying to model a job guarantee. So let's just assume <laughs> that it's working and off you go. Uh, look, I had some equations here, but I won't worry about it. So I think that's where I'll leave it and throw it over to questions and answers. So thank you.